Hello, and welcome to the DNA 2.0 webinar on the ElectroVector system. I'm Laura Whitman, Director of Biotech Marketing for DNA 2.0, and I'll be your facilitator for this webinar. Before in marketing, I was a research biochemist in both academic and pharmaceutical labs. We'll start in just a minute, but first a few quick housekeeping items. First, feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will do our best to answer when possible, or at the end of the webinar. You can submit your questions by typing them into the box on the right side of your screen. If your question is not answered during the webinar, we will email you an answer within the next 24 hours. We are recording this webinar, and it will be available for viewing on our website in about 48 hours. You should receive an email with the link. I'd like to thank you for joining us and hundreds of researchers from around the world to listen to this webinar. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Menni Gore. Menni is the DNA 2.0 Electro Product Manager. Menni has worked in molecular biology research for many years with experience in gene expression studies, neuroscience, and cancer biology. Thanks so much, Menni. Thank you, Laura. Um, hi, I'm Menni Gore, and I'll be presenting the Electro Vector System. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone for your time and for joining us today to learn more about the electrovector system. Now, as an introduction to the electrovector system, I'd like to go over some of the advantages of the electro system. Now, what we did was we compared electro to other cloning systems, such as Gibson, Gateway, Golden Gate, and Infusion, just to name a few. Now, shown here is a comparison to the more popular cloning systems, um, like the Gibson and the Gateway. So we are, of course, really excited about our Electra system and feel that it offers several advantages over other cloning systems. Now firstly, it is faster. Then it, it also it is better in that you can shuttle your open reading frames into multiple vectors. And for that, we offer a, wide, a large selection of ready-to-use vectors and also the reagent kit to facilitate all the cloning reactions. The cloning is scarless, so there are no additional um, sequences left behind as part of your open reading frame that can potentially affect your downstream expression. You can also use PCR products without any cleanup, so you can go directly into the cloning reaction. Of course, importantly, it is IP free, so there are no associated licensing costs. And of course, it is also more cost effective compared to other cloning systems. Now, before we go into details about the electrovector system, shown here is an overview of how the whole cloning process works. So basically, what you have is your cloning vector, which we call the P mother vector, which contains your gene of interest or the open reading frame. You can also use the PCR product. You mix it in with an expression vector, which is your daughter vector, and it contains compatible overhangs to your open reading frame. You have your electro reagent mix, so you mix the three components together in a single tube reaction. You incubate for five minutes at room temperature, so basically on your bench top. You transform into competent E. coli cells, and then you plate the transformation onto selection media with either a single selection antibiotic in this case shown here is kenamycin, or optionally with counter selection markers. And we'll get into that a little bit later. You incubate overnight, and basically what you see then are greater than 95% of your transformants with the open reading frame of interest. So the reaction is really fast and efficient. Now, looking into a little more of the details of what the cloning uh, system offers, what I'm going to discuss today are basically the cloning mechanism, meaning how the system works, some of the, the components that go into the system, how to set up um, the reactions, so the protocol, and some applications. So starting with the cloning mechanism, uh, how the electro system works is basically it uses the type 2S enzyme SAP1. It has a 7 base pair non-palindromic recognition sequence, and it's shown here. And like in all other type 2S enzymes, it cuts outside its recognition sequence, leaving a three base pair, five prime overhang. Now, this is advantageous because one, it's unlike other type 2S enzymes in that uh, where 
they leave four base pair overhangs, so you have to be have to worry about being in frame. So with in our case, since it leaves a three base pair overhang, you don't have to ever worry about being in frame. And secondly, uh, we've taken advantage of the fact that all open reading frames start with an ATG. Uh, so we've designed our vectors. Basically, all our vectors have compatible overhangs to accept your open reading frame starting with, so we have a TAC at the 5 prime end and ends with a GGT at the 3 prime end. Now shown here is a sequence view of what that looks like. So you have your SAP1 recognition uh, sequences shown in the pink boxes here. Uh, these are placed in reverse orientation flanking your open reading frame. So when you cut with SAP1, what you basically get is your open reading frame starting with the ATG and ending in the CCA. So moving on, just to show you an overview of how this cloning process works. So basically it's three components as I pointed out earlier. You have your cloning vector which is the P mother vector. You have your expression vector which is the P daughter vector and then you have your electrode reagents mix which contains your SAP1 and ligase enzymes. So when you put these three together, basically your gene is excised with SAP1. And I as I'd shown you earlier, your open reading frame has the overhangs ATG at the 5 prime end and CCA at the 3 prime end. It finds its compatible overhangs in the P daughter vector. And so basically what you then get is a final product is a daughter vector with your gene inserted scar-free. So now that we've had a little overview We've seen what those components are, and now we can look into a little more detail as to each of the components. So the first component, as I pointed out, is the cloning vector or the P mother vector. You can also use a PCR product to move your open reading frame directly into either a P mother vector or a P daughter vector. Now the second component is an expression vector, which is the P daughter. And of course the third component is the electro reagents kit, which facilitates cloning the whole cloning process. So the first component is the P mother or the cloning vector and shown here is a schematic of the P mother vector. What the P mother vector has is a selection marker. In this case shown here is ampicillin. You have counter selection markers and we offer that in two options. One is the FES and the other is the RPSL. So what the FES is, is it's a marker that confers sensitivity to chlorophenylalanine. This is an analog of phenylalanine. So what this really means is when you mix, you have a reaction mix with your mother and daughter and you plate your transformation onto plates containing the counter selection marker. In this case, let's look at chlorophenylalanine. What that means is any cells that get the P mother carry carried over will not be able to grow on this media. So basically what you're doing is selecting out against your P mother vector. So and similarly that's what, how RPSL works. It confers sensitivity to streptomycin. So when you plate the transformation on plates containing streptomycin, it'll select out against any mother vector that carries the RPSL marker. So we offer this vector as a linearized vector and we give you enough uh, plasmid to uh, to run 10 reactions. It, it has SAP1 recognition sites and why that is an advantage is because you can reuse your mother vector. So basically you can put in one ORF, you can change it out and replace with other open reading frames of interest. Shown, and of course you, your open reading frame can either be synthesized uh, and you can come to us for gene synthesis or you can use a PCR product. Shown here is a sequence view of what that is. So again you have your SAP1 recognition sites flanking your open reading frame. So when it cut, when you cut with SAP1 or with the electro reagents mix, what you then get is your open reading frame with the ATG and CCA overhangs. Now shown here is a dual, uh, dual arrow. So what that means is it's a reversible reaction in that since you have both SAP1 and ligase in the same mix and you still continue to have your SAP recognition sites, what the, your open reading frame can basically shuttle in and out of the vector. And this is similar to any other restriction enzymes where you, basically the reaction, you have an equilibrium between 
excising and re-ligating of your insert. So this again points to the fact that this is an advantage because then you can actually reuse your P mother vector as a holding vector for all your open reading frames. Now the other component is if you don't wish to put your open reading frame into a mother vector, you can PCR out your product. So moving your open reading frame of interest to the electro vector system is easy. How you go about doing that is you PCR your open reading frame with primers containing the SAP1 recognition sequence and overhangs. So that's shown here in the sequence view. You have your forward primer and you have your reverse primer. And what those are comprised of is 15 to 20 base, uh, bases of nonspecific sequence. You have your SAP1 recognition sequence followed by the ATG overhang. And what you then do is add on, so you basically make primers with these ends and add on 15 to 20 base pairs of your open reading frame uh, to the primer to amplify your open reading frame. And then you and then when you cut with SAP1, basically then what ends up happening is you again generate the ATG CCA overhangs, which are then compatible with all of our vectors. So moving on, the next component then is the expression vector, the P daughter vector. Now what that contains is again se a selection marker, and ideally you want it to be different from your P mother vector. That way you can select out against the P mother. It is provided as a linearized vector and we give you again enough for 10 reactions. It has compatible overhangs, TAC at the 5 prime end and GGT at the 3 prime end. Now what we also have is a stop codon following the GGT. So when you design your open reading frame, you don't have to include a stop codon. So when you have a C-terminal fusion, what it then does is reads through the GGT into the fusion protein and then the stop codon follows the fusion protein. Now in the event that you really don't want this GGT, it's a small amino acid glycine, but if you really don't want it at the, end, at the three prime end, what you simply do is include a stop codon as part of your open reading frame. So that way uh, you get your open reading frame that is completely scarfy without a single amino acid. Again, the other important thing to make, uh, point out here is there are no SAP1 recognition sites. So all you get is a vector with overhangs. So when your open reading frame gets ligated into the P daughter vector, there's no way you can excise it back out. So it, this is actually an advantage because as I pointed out earlier with the P mother vector, the reaction is reversible, so you can keep getting your insert getting excised out and re-ligating back in. Now when you mix the P daughter vector into, when you have an expression vector present, all the insert moves towards the P daughter. So you're now shifting that equilibrium towards more product formation. So that makes the reaction really fast and efficient. And also once it's in the daughter vector, it's stable and there's no way you can excise it back out. So you can use your expression vector or the P daughter vector to insert your open reading frame, either moving it from your P mother vector or you can use a PCR product as we had talked about earlier. And we also offer a large selection of P daughter vectors, so you have a wide range to choose from. Okay, now before we go into what the components of the electro reagent kit, it sounds like we have a question, so I'm going to take... Great, thank you, Medney. The first question is, what is the insert size maximum for these vectors? Uh, it all depends. I mean, that's a good question. What we want to say is, is de uh, definitely almost, uh, you can have any length of your open reading frame. Uh, it does, to an extent, depend on what vector you're going into, so what host system and what vector you're working with. But other than that, um, I think there's no limitation on the size of your insert. Perfect. The next question is, do you offer cloning services to move my ORF library from my current vector to your P mother vectors? Uh, yes, and I think uh, we are would be really happy to discuss your specific projects. So you can call us anytime, and we'll be giving all that contact information to you. So we'd 
definitely be happy to address that for you. So now we can move on on to uh, what the, the third component, which is the electro reagents kit. Now this also, of course, facil facilitates all the cloning. And the kit includes, what we uh, provide is the electro buffer. So that includes the buffer and ATP. It has electro enzyme mix, which is a mix of SAC1 and T4 ligase. And we also include a positive control, which is a P mother vector. So basically a cloning vector, which contains a yellow fluorescent protein. In this case, we've used one of our paint box proteins called Pringle YFP. And so this is basically serves as a positive control for the electroreaction. So when you include a P mother and you trans it basically transfers your YFP into whichever expression vector that you choose, uh, part of the electrosystem. And what you then get is yellow colonies as transformants. So you know that your reaction is working. And this is what it looks like. You can basically see it under visible light as yellow as well. And if you put it under UV, of course, it fluoresces yellow. Now, just to go over briefly, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on this protocol because it is also available on our website, plus we include it on all the data sheets that go out with all of our vectors, and as well as the reagents kit. Now, just to go over briefly, you basically mix your uh, plasmid components, meaning your, either your mother DNA or PCR product with your p-daughter vector, and then you add in the other two components, which is the electro buffer and the electro enzyme. You incubate, and this is set up in a single reaction tube, and you incubate at room temperature for 5 to 20 minutes, and you transform the reaction into competent cells, and then you can plate on either a single selection antibiotic, or optionally you can include the counter selection. You incubate the plates overnight, and you pick transformants, and you should get greater than 95% of your transformants with the open reading frame of interest. Now, just to go over what the time course looks like. So what we, de what we did was we took a P mother vector, which has a Fias counter selection marker and an AMP selection marker, mixed it with one of our P daughter vectors. It's an E. coli vector with a T5 promoter high copy and with a canamycin selection marker. So we set up several reactions and looked at a time course ranging from 0 to 60 minutes, which is shown here on the x-axis. Along the y-axis are the number of colonies per nanogram of the vector. And what we did was we plated the transformations on plates with a single selection antibiotic shown in blue here with a canamycin uh, selection marker. And then we also plated the reactions with a dual selection, meaning you have the selection marker canamycin plus the counter selection, in this case chlorophenylalanine, because the mother carries the FIAS marker. So you can select out against the mother. So as you can see here, the blue and the red on single selection versus a dual selection, there is not much of a difference. So you get almost an equal number of colonies. When you look at carryover from the P mother vector, so we've set up separate reactions where you just include just the P mother, and that's shown in green and the purple cross. And we played it on single selection media plus with a dual selection. And as you can see, the numbers are very minimal. You basically get no background from the P mother carryover. So we've shown here uh, two time points for the P mother carry over 5 minutes and 40 minutes. And as you can see on a single selection uh, plate, you get less than 5% as your background. And if you include a dual selection, you basically, the number falls down to negligible. So really no background from P mother carry over. So basically here what you're seeing is you get hundreds of transformants in 5 minutes at room temperature. The electro reaction is complete in 40 minutes, and greater than 95% of your transformants in the p-daughter vector have your open reading frame of interest. Now, moving on to some of the applications. So, one of the more obvious examples is you can transfer your open reading frame into multiple p-daughter vectors. And so, shown here is a schematic where you have a p-mother vector with your gene of interest. And you can transfer it in, at the same time, basically set up several reactions with different daughter vectors with different functionalities. So what we offer 
is a pretty large selection of, you can have PDOTAs uh, with high, medium, or low copy. You can have strong, medium, weak RBSs, secretion leaders, promoters, NOC terminal fusions, and of course, bisostronic expression. And we also offer these in several different host systems, bacterial, mammalian, and yeast. So one example of this, a real time example is we wanted to look at the effect of different secretion signals on protein expression. So what we've done is we've looked at expression of CAL with 10 different secretion signals in PICU. So what we then have is a, sel a selection of P daughter vectors with these different, different secretion signals. So shown here is a western blot of um, what's been run on here is a supernatant of the CALP. So you're looking at the secreted CALP protein, with, which is under the control of all these different 10 different secretion signals. And the point here is well, the, it just points to the power of the electrovector system in which uh, you can just quickly take your open reading frame and transfer it into several different vectors to look at where your optimal protein expression is. So clearly here, there's some secretion signals that don't work as well with CAL. And similarly, you can do the same thing with any open reading frame of interest, and you can quickly see where what your expression profile looks like. Now the next application or example is that of multi-fragment assembly. Now as I pointed out earlier, SAP, we use SAP1 for cloning into the system. And so what that means is SAP1 cuts outside its recognition sequence. So you can basically include any number of overhangs, uh, different overhangs to clone into. So what we then did was we looked at assembly of two yellow fluorescent protein fragments, so neither of which alone makes a fully functional YFP. So it's only when the two fragments come together that you get a fully functional YFP. So to do that, we mix the two fragments with the daughter, a daughter vector, so an expression vector. So shown here are just the ends, the five prime end of the daughter vector and then the three prime end to show you the overhangs. We mix it in with two fragments of the yellow fluorescent protein, shown here is fragment one and then fragment two. And what I'm showing here is just the ends of the two fragments, including the daughter vector. So what I'm not showing is the recognition sites, all I'm trying to show you here is what the overhangs are. So when you cut with SAP1, you get the following overhangs. So the two fragments have an overhang that is compatible with each other, so they can go, to, go together, and the other ends of each of the fragments are compatible with either end of your p-daughter vector. So these two ends basically are compatible for your yellow fluorescent fragments, and then either end, as I pointed out, are compatible with the vector. So in the presence of ligase, which is again forms, is one of the components of the electroreagent mix, you get you, the compatible ends are ligated in and you get a fully functional yellow fluorescent protein. And this is seen, we saw it as thousands of yellow colonies. So we know the reaction works. Now what we've shown here is just assembly of two fragments. So similarly, you can envision uh, putting together multiple fragments and we have a whole list of different overhangs that can be used and that way you can assemble multiple fragments in a single reaction. So it is very, very powerful. So to summarize what we've talked about so far, basically you can synthesize genes and we can synthesize those genes for you here at DNA 2.0 and you can either clone into the P mother vector or P daughter vectors. You can also PCR your open reading frame and clone directly into either the P mother or multiple P daughter vectors. You can always shuttle your open reading frame from a P mother vector into multiple P daughter vectors. So basically your P mother vector acts as your holding vector and then you can just take that and transfer it into multiple P daughter vectors of your choice. I've shown that multi-fragment assembly is possible and we offer a large selection of p-daughter vectors and of course we offer the electro reagents kit to facilitate all the cloning. Now if you don't find a vector that you like as which is part of our large selection of p-daughter vectors or if you really have a favorite vector 
we can of course help you electrify your vector. So what that means is DNA 2.0 can modify almost any cloning or expression vector of your choice into an electro vector. So what then that would mean is then you basically have an electro vector ready for use um, and you can uh, settle your open reading frame into your favorite vector just like the other electro vector system vectors. And more importantly, your vectors basically remain your property and the entire system is IP free. So what that means is there's no license requirements, no royalties, and no limitations. Now moving on, this concludes our electro portion of the talk. But for those of you who are not familiar, familiar with DNA 2.0, Basically, we offer a complete solution. So what that is, is we also offer gene designer software that helps you design your constructs and it is offered free of charge. We can optimize your gene for you using the gene GPS technology. Of course, we, we can always synthesize your gene. We can also help you clone your open reading frame of interest into either the electro vectors or any other expression vectors from our selection of vectors. And also, if you have a favorite vector, we can help you clone into that as well. <clears throat> and then the next step then is to facilitate all this downstream synthesis. We can then, we offer a whole selection of expression vectors, and that includes the electro system, which we've just introduced. And again, we can help you clone into any of these vectors. And then the other side of the business, of course, is our protein engineering platform, whereby we can help you enhance protein properties. So what that basically means is we can help you manipulate your gene at the protein level. So basically what you're looking at is a complete solution in one single place. And of course, we offer PhD level support, so it's superior service and we are available to answer your questions every day including weekends. And just to remind you, all genes are made here locally in California and you will own 100% of your sequences. Now lastly, if you have further questions or uh, you need contact information, you can always call us. We can answer your questions or you can email us at customer support or you can always visit our website for more information. So I'd like to thank you for your time and we would be happy to take any more questions. Thank you so much, Menni. Um, no surprise, of course, one of the first questions that came up is why is it called Electra? <laughs> That's a little fun fact that we have for you. So the reason it's called Electra is it's based on the Greek tragedy Electra and the reason we call it Electra is because it allows you to select against the P mother vector. Just like in the Greek tragedy, Electra destroyed her own mother. So again, like I said, the system is really robust and thankfully for us and for you, unlike the original Electra, your selection of the daughter against the mother will not require an atonement to the gods. And of course, if you want to learn more about the Greek tragedy, just as a fun fact, here are some sites that you can go visit to learn more. Great, thanks. Um, so one of the next questions that was quite common is, does a PCR product need to contain the SAP1 site? Yes, your PCR product will need to contain the SAP1 sites because what you're counting on is the overhangs to go into compatible daughter vectors. So when you include the SAP1 sites, when you cut with SAP1, it basically generates the overhangs, ATG and CCA, as I pointed out, to be compatible with our electro vectors. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, is, and I know you talked about this, but I think they just want to reiterate or clear it up a little bit, is can DNA 2.0 convert an expression vector into an elector vector? Are there any technical or IP related limitations? That's a good question and we can absolutely help you convert your vector into an elector vector. So we have experts that can do that, they can modify your vector to include Electra, the main point is they will be checking for SAP1 sites, so we'll modify your vector so it does not contain any other SAP1 sites elsewhere in the vector and certainly can help you design your vector to become an Electra vector. Great, thanks. Um, next question is, what transformation efficiencies do you get for the constructs using more than 
two or more fragments? You do the multiple fragments. That's a good question, and what we found is you can get over 90% of your transformants containing the full insert. So the transformation efficiency is very high. So another question, can your system be customized to other organisms with strong restriction systems? Um, it looks like it's asking about other organisms and other systems, or what host systems are there. Could you use it in a different host system than we've already talked about? Uh, I'm sure if you have a favorite vector that you like working with, with that particular host system, and we don't offer it, we can certainly help you. It kind of talks to the same. We can help you modify your vector to an electrovector. So I'm certain you can use it. Great. Um, next question. Can you combine the vector with other tags, like a his tag? Yes, you can, and we offer a range of vectors that have his tags at both the N or the C terminal um, N. So you can choose vectors that have either of those tags, or we can help you add in uh, these tags to your favorite vector as well. Another question about the, um, the multiple fragment assembly. Um, in the assembly of multiple fragments, are you including SAP-derived codons that then alter the amino, sac excuse me, amino acid sequence of the encoded protein? No, we don't. Um, we try to keep the mutation silent. So the only things we will avoid are the SAP ones, including SAP1 sites within the sequence. So we try to keep your uh, amino acid sequence the same. Great. Um, another question is, um, are your daughter vectors lentiviral or retroviral compatible? We have a range of vectors coming out that are not ready yet. We offer some lentiviral vectors and we will eventually have vectors that are compatible with the electrosystem. Will, here's the next question, will internal SAP1 recites reduce efficiencies, especially if they result in ATG overhangs? Well, the main thing is since we are using SAP1 as our cloning system, um, the cloning mechanism, uh, we will avoid using SAP1 sites or having SAP1 sites within your open reading frame or in the vector. So that's definitely, uh, you don't want to have SAP1 sites. I like this next question. It's pretty straightforward. Where can I get a comprehensive list of all the p-daughter vectors? Okay, that's a question that you can visit our website. This is the site here, DNA 2.0 slash electro, where you can get a whole range of all the vectors that we offer. How many are there right now? There's over 100. There's like 130 right now. Okay. Electro vectors. Far more <laughs> Okay, clearly lots of people interested in the, the multiple fragment assembly, so two more questions regarding that. The first is, how many fragments can one simultaneously clone in multi-fragment cloning using, this, using the electro system? What we've looked at is um, we've assembled five to six fragments, and we also know that we have hundreds of overhangs that we've identified that are unique. and can help you assemble multiples of fragments. So I really don't see, I mean, you can envision having a library basically with different overhangs that can go together in one reaction. And the next question also on the multiple fragments, using that, could you assemble multiple genes, i.e. with multiple ATG start codons that would all be in a row? Uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to. We have not tried it, but um, I'm sure you can. Just looking through the questions. There's quite a few, and I'm really excited um, picking out some of the best ones. And as a reminder, any questions that we aren't able to answer during this webinar, we will send you the, we will email those answers to you within 24 hours. So next, good questions. How would you compare the electro system with some of the other systems that are out there? For example, just to not name them, but I think everybody's familiar with them, with Infusion or Gateway or Gibson. The reason it's different, firstly, it's scarless. So like in other systems, and you know which the systems are, is 
it, they leave small um, sequences that are left as part of the uh, your open reading frame. And what we're saying is your open reading frame does not contain any additional sequences at all. So it is completely scarless. And of course you can also, you can see our website, we have a comparison table on the Electra page that shows you the differences between our uh, Electra system compared to Gibson and Gateway. And the other important point I'd like to make here is that it is completely IP free. So you have no associated licensing costs like other systems. So that's a huge advantage too. Great, thank you. Um, another question is, do you need a specific background of E. coli for the transformations? No, you don't. Not if you're using um, just a single selection antibiotic. If you go to counter select using a second marker and you don't have to use the counter selection, uh, you do need cells that are sensitive to, that are resistant to streptomycin, for instance. Wonderful. Um, coming down to the end, it looks like, and we've gotten most of the questions, especially those that pertain to lots of different people. Um, for those that are getting a little bit more specific for your project, um, we're not going to answer them during this webinar, but we will get in touch with you or encourage you to contact us directly for very project specific questions. So the last question is, how, how is Electra different from the other systems that are out there? They seem kind of similar. Can you reiterate the advantages again? Okay, so just to go over advantages again. One is, I mean, first and foremost, I think what really distinguishes us from the others is that we are scarless, so there's no additional sequences left behind that can potentially interfere with your downstream expression. Secondly, we are IP-free, so you have no restrictions or no licensing requirements. And then also, it's really, really fast and simple to set up. So. The, you don't take days, or it's not complicated, it's very, very simple. Plus, we offer a whole range of both cloning and expression vectors. So you can take your open reading frame and quickly shuttle into various either host systems or different uh, vectors with different functionalities. So quickly get a readout and optimize your protein expression. Perfect. Um, that pretty much gets through all of the, the main questions. Again, we've gotten a couple of questions, or quite a few actually, that are very project specific. We'll be get, contacting you researchers directly to get back to those. And of course, I encourage anyone who is working through some thoughts of how they want to use the electric system for, their pro for your particular project to contact us directly. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. We hope you've discovered a valuable new set of tools with which to move your research forward quickly and efficiently. And we look forward to working with you on your next project. Again, if you have any additional questions, you can contact us by phone or email, as noted on the last slide. And of course, a copy of this webinar will be available on our website in about 48 hours. For more information on any DNA 2.0 products and services, you can visit our website. Thank you so much.